My name is Jason Harrison. I'm from New Nature Church in Bendigo, Australia, and I am absolutely ecstatic and honoured to be doing this live interview with a modern-day pioneer, forerunner, and even a personal hero of mine. Some of you uh, may not know the history um, behind the scenes, but there has been lots of emails over, I would say, the past 15 years with Dr. Sunday Adelaja, who I'm, um, I'm going to introduce in a moment. And, but before we do that, um, I just want to let people know that when my son was born, Judah, 12 years ago, we actually named his middle name Sunday after this great man that I'm having the pleasure of interviewing tonight. And so without further ado, we're going to jump into sharing and having some Q&A time with Dr. Sunday Adelaja, who's live streaming right now via Zoom from Kiev in the Ukraine, and it's just past 2 p.m. 2 p.m. there. So this is the Glory Lounge. We're now up to, okay, 24 views live right now. So that's increasing. And my wife has just commented that the sound is great. So brilliant. We're ready to roll. All right. Well, before we hand over to Sunday Adelaja and we ask some, some poignant questions, I might just share a little bit of also the extended journey that I was so 15 years ago, I think it was around about 15 years ago, Dr. Sunday Adelaja came to one of our great cities in Australia called Adelaide and he was preaching at a conference there called Influences alongside um, T.D. Jakes. And my wife went there with her parents and now she, um, she did not know that Dr. Sunday was going to be speaking. And she gets there and she messaged me after the first session. This is what he's sharing is absolutely phenomenal. And um, I said, what do you mean? I said, this guy's Dr. Sunday Adelaide. He's speaking on the kingdom of God. We've never heard anything like this before. So she came home after three days and brought a stack of DVDs. I listened to them all. And oh my goodness, the gospel of the kingdom that Sunday Adelaide cracked open changed my life and changed it to a great my life. Um, and so from that, I actually decided to Google him and find an email address. And I emailed Dr. Sunday about 15 years ago, and he actually responded. And from the last 15 years, we've never actually met face to face like this. We have sent emails, um, we've sent each other gifts. My 33rd birthday, <laughs> Sunday actually sent this to me in the mail. It's a book that he, that he has authored, The Man That God Will Use. And inside, there's a personal note just to myself on my 33rd birthday. That was seven years ago. Such a blessing. This is a treasure. It sits on this bookshelf. I rarely lend it out to anyone. <laughs> and then another book that's changed my life that he wrote was called Church Shift. I believe some of you have probably read this. Absolutely powerful. So uh, check those out. And the last thing I want to share before we um, hand over to Sunday is this DVD. And you can get it from the store in Australia called Kura, or probably on Amazon. It's called To My Last Breath. And it's the story of Sunday Adelaide from when he came from Nigeria to the Ukraine, uh, to Belarus on a scholarship, um, suffered persecution, and then to launching the church and all the arms of ministry that flow out of that. And it's absolutely phenomenal. So I'll be sharing those resources on my page shortly as well. So. Yeah, I, I might just share this video as well, just so we're getting a few more viewers, a broader reach. So let's just share that. Okay, just about there. Now, Dr. Sunday, I'd love for you, um, just while I'm sharing that, for you just to share a little bit about your journey. I touched on it briefly, um, but if you'd just like to share, I guess, um, before we get into some questions, um, how you ended up in, in the Ukraine, and, and then what, what led on from there. Very good. Thank you so very much, Jason. You've been a great disciple and a great uh, follower. Even though you did not come to the conference in Adelaide when I was speaking, but uh, just getting the videos and the message through your wife, you've, been, you've proved to be a more ardent follower than a lot of people that were there in that meeting. 
And that shows your heart because that shows that uh, you are a man after God's heart. And it's all that matters. It doesn't really matter if we've never met or if you didn't come to that meeting. But because you are so hungry for the truth, you saw the truth and you didn't let it go. It's like the story of the parable that Jesus uh, told about when he said, when somebody discovers the kingdom, his attitude should be to sell all his possessions. Everything is God. To go and buy that treasure. Because the kingdom is such a treasure. It's a huge treasure, much more, uh, yeah, much more valuable than anything imaginable uh, in this world. So uh, that's what you did. You just went after it. And, and I, mean, I know that that time you were going to another church, a new ministry, you had other affiliations, but you basically had to give up everything to pursue the kingdom. And that is just beautiful. That's beautiful. So you have inspired me to see that there are young men. For me, you are a young man, especially that time, 15 years ago. So for that a young man like this in Australia is absolutely passionate for the things of God. And that, that's a great encouragement. And because in Australia, to my surprise, when I got to Australia, I discovered that the gospel of the kingdom was unknown. Many people all over the world know the Australian church, especially the Hillsong Church and CCC and other churches and OPC, you know, all these other churches that are there that are big in Australia. I discovered that they don't preach the kingdom. And it's like the kingdom is a strange message over there. And uh, But you heard that message of the kingdom and identified it as the right message for the hour, and you just went for it. And well, my journey is that um, when I was 19 years old, I won a scholarship from my country, Nigeria, to move over to Russia to study journalism. But the thing is, the communists or the communist party that gave the scholarship, because I actually got, got my scholarship from the communist party. The communist party that gave the scholarship, they had their own agenda. And the agenda that they had was that people like me and other young ambitious men from Africa would come over here to Russia, learn communism and atheism, and then go back to Africa to do socialist communist revolution. But you know what God did? After they had given me the scholarship, God gave me and them a huge surprise. Six months before I left, six months before I left Africa, uh, actually, just before I got the scholarship, six months before I left Africa, I got saved. And I got saved so, you know, d dynamically. My salvation was so dramatic and dynamic that I was so passionate for God that in those six months, I was able to learn more of God than some people learn in years. So, but so it was enough for me. Six months in the Lord was enough for me to be cubed to come to communism and to be <laughs> to, to be the one to transform and change their country from communist <laughs> and socialist uh, from their revolution to God's revolution. So that's what happened. God surprised them and he, he, he got me saved six months before I came and that was enough. So when I came here, there was no church, no, no pastors, no congregation. So I had to, first of all, by myself, you know, be doing, uh, you know, be serving God in the underground church by myself. Then later on, I found some few believers. So uh, five wow. of us, five other people, six with me, six. And we were doing, we were hiding from the communists and hiding from the, uh, from the communist party and serving God. Then eventually we met with the Soviet people who are in the underground church as well. And uh, so from there, uh, you know, we started the ministry indirectly started. So I did my, mas my first degree in journalism, did my master's in journalism, and God, I wanted to continue to do my PhD, but God just told me, no, that's not why I brought you here. I brought you here for this purpose, to be able to spread not the good, not the bad news, but the good news. So I graduated. And then, you know, moved over from one country where I did my master's, Belarus is called. I moved from Belarus 
to Kiev, Ukraine, where I am right now, and started the Embassy of God Church. Uh, it's what used to be called Word of Faith in the beginning, but we started it 25 years ago, and actually it's going to be 26 this year. And uh, so, yeah, that's our story. We, it grew to be the biggest church, the biggest evangelical church in Europe, and uh, with 25,000 people here in Ukraine, in Kiev, then all over the world with about 100,000 people. But it has always been a fight. All the way through is a fight. <laughs> I'm still in a fight right now. <laughs> but that's what it takes to change a nation. If you, want, if you just want to build a good church and you, know, you don't want troubles, just, yeah, Satan doesn't care that you are doing a church. You can just be a good pastor you know, and uh, you know, be getting your tithe and offering and uh, people saying yeah, yes to you and everything. But if you really want to change a nation, then you should be ready for a fight. And, um, but that's what we are here for. We are not supposed to just have a few disciples following us and just to, you know, be in some little church and doing some things insignificantly that the world doesn't even know we're there. What we are supposed to do is to impose the kingdom of God upon nations. The goal of the gospel and the purpose of the gospel is not just to be religious, is to bring transformation to the nations of the world. We are not commanded to disciple just some Christians. He said, go and make disciples of nations. So nations are supposed to be, are supposed to be discipled by us. That is the goal. We are supposed to be changing the culture. We are supposed to be discipling the nations. We are supposed to introduce the lifestyle of the kingdom and to replace the lifestyle that the, the nation is living. We are supposed to adjust the culture of the nation to be in line with the culture of the kingdom of God. And that's what it's all about. So I see myself not just as a pastor of the Embassy of God Church, if I were to be doing that, that's a waste of my life and a waste of time. So Embassy of God is just my pulpit. It's my pulpit. It's my podium. It's my platform that I stand on to be able to reach out to the old nation and to be able to subdue the culture, the mindset, the worldview, the, 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 the value system of the nation to be in line with the value system and the worldview of the kingdom of God. Wow. That, <laughs> man, what you shared is absolutely life-changing and powerful, man. We have had a few um, technical issues um, with the Facebook Live. I am recording the Zoom, so I'm not okay. sure why that's dropping out. Um, we're getting like a lot of people watching and it's, it's, it's timing out, so I'm not sure why, but I'm recording the Zoom. We can continue on it. I can just upload this video to Facebook later. But I yeah, I think we could do that. We could upload the Facebook later and then YouTube and yeah, just let's okay. record it. Right. Okay. Maybe they are not hearing the voice, maybe the volume. Yeah, the, no the video vo is just it's it's starting on Facebook and then it's it's dropping out after okay. a certain amount of time and then it's yeah, I think we should just do the we should just continue recording it and people will enjoy it later. Sure. Okay. No worries. That's fine. I'll close that off for now. Wow. So the phenomenal journey from Nigeria to have a scholarship in Belarus, studying journalism, planning a church, um, reading today from 1994, eight years onwards, seeing a million decisions to follow Jesus. I I've watched you closely over the 15, the last 15 years or so, and the impact that you've had in a nation and the change that you've been able to, to bring from the tops of the mountain all the way down has been absolutely inspiring and has you know shown me what, what it looks like to live as a son of God who knows their identity and their authority. And that's one thing I'd love to just touch on with you is um, one thing that really stands out is you know who you are in Christ and the authority that you, you move from. Um, do you want just maybe just to speak into that a little bit or some keys for what it looks like for those who may be struggling in, in their authority. What, what's really helped you to walk in, in your authority where you're seeing such significant change? 
um, in the nation and the nations. Yes, I think I, have an, I had an advantage. And my advantage was in the fact that uh, when I got saved, I was not too, much, too long in the church, in the local church. Sometimes when you are sitting down in the church for too long, it becomes a disadvantage for you <laughs> because you, know, you learn how things are done and you begin to follow the patterns of men instead of God's pattern. So I was only six months as a Christian. Then I left, I went to Russia. The only thing I had with me was the Bible. And so I was reading the Bible with a fresh understanding, like, just like the way it is, without any coloration, without any body's interpretation disturbing or mendling into my understanding of what I was reading. So thanks to that, I took the word of God literally. So if it says that I am born of God, I, then dis I believe that. And I accept the fact that me being born of God means that this new birth is superior to my being born of a woman. And if, I, if my, my spiritual essence as a son of God is supposed to be aligned with the ultimate example that I've got, which is Jesus' example, then it means that I must model my life after the life of Jesus. And so I take the word of God serious. I take it to be literary in most of the cases when it relates to, to the believer. So uh, I, don't, I, I, I think it's sad to see that we have so many Christians who are not making any difference, who are not bringing any impact to the society. And I think that is connected to the way they have been taught in churches. For example, when we get saved, we are supposed to stop living for ourselves and begin to live for the one who died for us. L begin to live the Christ life and begin to demonstrate in our ambition, in our purpose, in our vision, in our, in our desires, the, everything that Jesus would have done. We are supposed to be living a life to glorify God, actually to live the life of Jesus in our body. So we are supposed to model our lives after what he wants. But what you see in churches today is that the churches will preach to you, okay, give your life to Jesus. Now, after you, give your, you finish giving your life to Jesus, then you come to church and they begin to tell you, now God wants to bless you. Now God wants you to be healed. Now God wants you to be this and this, you, you. So I was, I gave my life to Jesus, denying myself when I had salvation. But a few months later, the pastors and the teachings is returning me, my eye, to the center, to the center of my Christian life. So it's all about me now. So the church is for to entertain me, the music, the entertainment, the message, everything is about me, 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 me. Wow. So we, we subjugate God to a secondary position. And now it's all about me, 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 me. And when I'm just thinking about me, then I begin to use God for my goals, for my purpose, for what I want, instead of God who saved me for his purpose, instead of my life to be all about him instead of my life to be all about seeking to please him, seeking his kingdom, and how to please him and manifest that kingdom, how to become like him, how to obtain and uh, inculcate his character, his attitude into my life. Instead of that being the purpose, when I keep on hearing, oh, God wants this to you, for you to get this, God wants you to get this, it's all about me. So what ends up happening and this is why most Christians become so powerless and they don't walk in the authority of the believers. It's because, you know, they are worshiping themselves now. Because if you are thinking about yourself most of the time, if you go to church because of you, because of what you could get, because of what God could do for you, it means God is not God over your life. You are the God of your life. God is just the uh, sugar daddy. God is just the, uh, you know, Santa Claus that you are using to get what you want. So it is not all about God anymore. And God cannot back that up. 
God will not back that lifestyle up. The only lifestyle that God is going to support and back up is the lifestyle that is totally dedicated to the kingdom of God, seeking the kingdom of God, living for the purposes of God, pursuing the will of God here on earth as he, it is in heaven, bringing to, 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 to the earth God's desires. When your life is totally dedicated to the things of God, then the resources of God is dedicated to you. Then the power of God is dedicated to you. Then the manifestation of God is dedicated to you. The resources of God back you up because you have prioritized God. God will make you his priority. God will prioritize you too. But when you prioritize yourself and you are only using God like a slave boy, that's why we don't see the power of God. That's why there's, believers cannot really walk in God's authority because they don't know him. Wow. The way it's supposed to be is this. Once you get saved, the teachings of the church must be all about helping you to discover who your father is, getting to know your father. And next, secondly, how to develop intimacy with this, your father. When you know your father, when you develop closeness, intimacy with him, when you are attached to him, you know what? You will discover that it is easy to do exploits because they that know they are God will be strong and we yeah. do as it is all coming from the knowledge of God. If you will know him, you will manifest him. So what, what we see in churches is all about the pastor standing up there and everybody going to him to be blessed. And they are all waiting to get something for themselves. But yeah. so we need to kind of change the priority or the focus or the direction of teaching in most of the churches. Because Jesus said, if you want to follow me, you have to deny yourself. Well, that is the beginning of the Christian life. It starts with denying yourself. If you deny yourself and you take off your cross to discover him, to pursue after him, then you will discover that it is easy to walk in this authority of the believer. And it is easy to manifest the nature and the power and the, and the kingdom of God through the life of any believer. Wow, it's so good. And that's, that's one thing we've been pursuing and pioneering here in, in Bendigo, Australia, is we say that the, the kingdom of God is, is a full contact sport. You, you're, not sitting, you're, not, you're not getting saved to just sit and watch a game. You're getting saved so you can be, <laughs> be in the game, you know. And, um, and that's one thing we've really pursued and pioneered is, is a culture where, you know, we, we are kings, we are priests, we're all called... To, to do ministry, obviously there's the fivefold apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists who are called to equip the saints for the work of the ministry and to bring those saints to the stature and maturity of Christ. And I really feel that's one, one of the game changes that we're seeing in the church today is that it's not just about going and sitting in a pew. Yeah, go and receive and get taught, but you're, you're being equipped to then go out and do ministry. And that's one Beautiful. thing I've really admired. Beautiful really admired um, your teaching on that, which is, is so powerful. Um, I have a few, a few other questions here. If you don't mind me, just yes, jump, please. jumping Go ahead. Um, yep. So obviously with the gospel of the kingdom, Jesus didn't come declaring the gospel of salvation. He came declaring the gospel of the kingdom and salvation is found in the yes. kingdom. And we know that when Jesus spoke to Nicodemus, Nicodemus comes to him and he's like, you know, how do you become born again? Nicodemus thinking, that it's a, um, a natural birth. And Jesus said, no, it's spiritual. You're born from above. And he says, to see the kingdom, you must be born again. To enter, you must be born of water and of the spirit. And so when we're born again, it becomes the entry point to live in the kingdom of God now as a manifest te uh, present tense reality, which I really love. You know, I've, and I've watched that shift happen um, from an observation point of view over the last 15 years as even the, the, the word kingdom, I remember when it started to come into the, into the church in Australia and we're talking about the kingdom, but still not having an understanding of what it was. But, uh, you know, 10 years down the track, we're now understanding that we, we live in the kingdom. You know, Paul writes in, in Romans 14, 17, the kingdom is righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit, that we are righteous sons and daughters. The kingdom, uh, or right, uh, peace and joy are no longer natural emotions, but a spiritual dimension. 
that we now yes. live in and and you model that so well um looking down the track from 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 now say five years ten years time what do you what do you see happening with the church or what do you you see the church looking like um from five to ten years from now what, what are some big changes you, you see happening um i think that uh <laughs> this uh, coronavirus, COVID-19 <laughs> is a uh, precursor, a foreteller of what's going to happen in the future. The future church is going to be digital. It's going to be uh, online and it's going to be cyber in a cyber world. Just like now, most people don't go to church, because, but they are doing it like we are doing now through online. And the future church is going to be, you know, either people like it or they don't like it. 5G is a reality. 5G is going to be introduced. And once 5G is introduced, people are not going to be attached to a building anymore. And, you know, so the tradition and the culture of just going to a building to serve God is going to become weaker and weaker. And Jesus already spoke about this because in John chapter 4, Jesus was saying, A, he was telling his disciples and the Jews that a day is coming and the day is here already when you will not need to go to Jerusalem to worship God anymore. Wow. And you will not need to go to this mountain. They used to go to the mountain where the temple was. You will not need to go to this mountain to go into the temple. There will be no need for a physical temple to worship God. There will be no need to go to a, a shrine or a, a designated place to worship God. So he was telling them, what you will need to worship God is to be in spirit. That is virtual world. That is that's the virtual world. And that's what we're using right now. And so there was virtual world in the spirit or in Christianity, in the understanding of Jesus, before we had internet and online. The, it's the same thing. So... It, it, what really matters is the ability of Christians today to teach other Christians that, you know what, the ability to connect to the spirit realm, the ability to connect to the Father, to God, in the spirit, that is where the church is. That is where the real power is. So it says those people who will really worship God, they will be worshiping him in spirit and in truth. So there will be a new dimension of reaching out and preaching the gospel. It, with the emphasis will be not on building anymore, but on virtual reality, on you know, touching people with the spirit power. And it is at this hour that we need to teach believers to be able to release the power of spirit without really gathering in a building, to be able to transfer the impartation of the Holy Spirit, the power of God through the airwaves, to be able to release the truth of God and fill the airwaves with the truth of the kingdom and to be able to penetrate into every home through the power of the virtual reality, the power of the spirit. So I think the future of the church is when the church wakes up and begins to realize the tremendous power of walking in the spirit and of using the airwaves to release the energy of God, the power of God to change nations. And then you'll be able to have programs for, for example, we, I'm planning to have programs just for politicians. And so politicians will be in their countries, uh, they will be in their bedrooms. They don't need to even show up. They don't even need, I don't even need to know them. But they are there and they are washing you in their bedrooms or in their restrooms and they are, they are following you. When you, so we we should be able to change the way church is done. And okay, children ministry. You don't have to have a building to have children ministry. You could go online and have children ministry for kids in all nations of the world. You don't have to you know go have a pulpit to preach the gospel. You can go on air and just begin to speak, and people will be following you, and they will be hearing you in the airport, in the bus, in the stadiums. They will have their head uh, headphone on. And they are following you. So church is going to change from what we know it to be right now. And then we need to also learn to release the power of God to do miracles, healing through the airwaves. And I think this situation with COVID-19 is a, is, a, is a precursor for us. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a sign of the times. Maybe 
things are going to go back to normal and people are going to go back to the, to the normal way of doing things. But in the next 20 years or in the next 50 years, there will be no need. You don't need a virus anymore to tell you that there is no need to gather in buildings because the technology, the reality of virtual reality is going to be so dominant, is going to be so prevalent everywhere that, uh, you know, that you would not, there will be no need to go. It, I mean, with 5G technology, for example, it's going to work as if I and you were in the same place, as if we are seeing one another, right? In this, you know, we, we can just not touch one another, but wow. the virtual reality is going to be so emphasized. It's going to be so dominant that, you know, it doesn't really matter if you come to a place or you don't come to a place. You'll be able to, right now, some people are already practicing going to visit uh, museums. You could be here where you are in <laughs> Australia and coming to Ukraine to go to the museums of Ukraine and going to all the museums and see everything. You could, wow. you know, you could be walking down the streets of Ukraine and be able to see how life is here in Ukraine without leaving <laughs> your room. That is coming very soon. And wow. so those kind of things are going to remove the need for church and for building. Like, so we are now coming back to what Jesus told us that the work of the, the 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 work of faith is in the spirit. The faith of Christianity is doesn't have to be confined in a building. And Come he on. said it. And Paul said it that God doesn't dwell in a in buildings that are built by the hands of by the hands of man. God is dwelling in the spirit, and we are the temple of God. We are the temple of the Almighty God. And once we realize that, and we will be, be we will be able to have connection with God through spirit and truth, that will be the new face of Christianity, the future. It might not be next year. It might not be in five years or 10 years, but that is the future of the church in the next 20, 30, 40, maybe 50 years. Wow. Yeah, that's very interesting. You know, um, one thing we've been teaching our guys at the moment is that if we don't write the new narrative as the church, we're going to be told what the new narrative is. And we've, <laughs> That's so true. And we've been like, okay, what's what's God saying right now? You know, um, let's be ahead of the game. Let's be the yeah. ones. You know, we've been called to be the head and not the tail. And um, and even today, just in in the state of Victoria, which I live, they've just started to ease restrictions, so we can go back to meeting in groups of ten um, at the moment. But okay. they're still they're still saying churches aren't allowed to open. They're saying church, you know, um, only the production team is allowed. But what, one thing we did um, when we started New Nature three years ago is um, we, obviously reading the book of Acts, we see that the believers met daily in the homes and in the temple. And, you know, I, I've, I value the, the corporate gathering, but I also value the, the intimate gathering too. You know, the, the Greek word for called out ones or church is ecclesia or ecclesia. And, you know, we, we know what it says in the Bible where two or three are gathered. He's in the midst. And obviously, yeah. We're gathering in in body, but what does it look like to gather in the spirit online? <laughs> you know, and and see God move online, and um, yeah. So just seeing, it's going to be interesting. I'm, I'm very interested to see what the church is going to look like. I really believe in the next five to ten years, the face of the church is going to look radically different. Um, for us here in Australia, it feels like we've gone back to the Book of Acts to begin to go forward, and and we are seeing in homes people being baptized in water deliverance um, the last three people that have literally joined our church have all come out of the new age or the occult through Ooh. the through the power of god um, i did a glory lounge um, interview about a month ago with a friend named Corey, and he was training to be a high priest in shamanism and then jesus just grabbed a hold of him and we're seeing that at the moment begin to happen which is really cool wow. so I, I feel like you know right now at the moment we're allowed to gather back in homes and it's almost that decentralization of that big corporate meeting. You know, maybe they're still going to happen. I don't know. But um, I, I guess what we've seen in, in some circumstances where people actually um, hold the corporate meeting, big corporate meeting, as almost the pinnacle of their Christian existence. But we're actually, Jesus wants us to have a lifestyle of following him. You know, yeah. that wherever we are, if we're in a cafe, where two or three are gathered, there he is in the midst. He can break out yeah. in a cafe. He can break out in the yeah. library, like you said, in the airport. And yeah. technology is something that I think the church, like you're saying, has 
has to actually embrace in this in this season so that mm. we stay ahead of the game and that we get to write the yeah. narrative um but maybe who knows we'll have holograms as well so you know you might just be in a screen you'll be like zoomed in as a hologram and we'll have the whole 360 view and that'll be pretty cool so yeah <laughs> but we can always be translated too <laughs> <laughs> You, you do know that I, when I was in Europe with my family, um, it was 11 years ago, and I was, I was actually in the Ukraine embassy in Rome, and they denied my visa to, to come into the Ukraine. So, And what was the reason they gave? I, I couldn't really understand their thick Russian accent. It was <laughs> I, I, I waited in line all day. My rest of my family was off site, sightseeing. I was stuck at the Ukraine embassy in Rome. and. Um, thick russian accents and i was trying to get the visa to then catch a flight to visit you and it just just didn't happen but that's okay i'm still believing that one day maybe <laughs> I'll, bring going my to son, happen. I'll bring my son with me yeah he's going to yeah he has to see the senior sunday <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> amen um so I'm, I'm just want to apologize too just for the technical difficulties um with facebook well, well, so but we are recording this, so we'll definitely upload this onto YouTube and then we can share the whole thing in, yes. in, one, in one bite. So my apologies on that. I'm not sure what, what's happened there. Um, no problem. All right, so we looked at um, yeah, what the church could look like in five to 10 years, keys to moving in authority. Um, I guess right now for, for what's ahead, we've talked about technology. Is there anything else that you see that the church needs to, to shift in? Um, whether it be in their thinking or whether it be in their message um, or their method, apart from technology that, that we need to lay a hold of right now. And I, I guess part of it was for us was transitioning from the escapist theology of just getting saved and holding tight, waiting for Jesus to return so we can go to heaven to actually getting saved, entering the kingdom now and then bringing heaven to earth. Um, that was a massive well, change. I think the, the thing that needs to change in the, in the church is actually the message. Your church, and I so commend you that you had the faith enough to step out and start this church because you are living in a country where uh, it's not a popular message yet. And you are the one restoring you, your generation, and the, mess, the church that you've started, you are the one restoring the message that Jesus commanded us to teach. Now, all these other things that people are doing, the emphasis of just looking at the church like an entertainment center, just where you have one hero, it's just speaking, 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 and talk, talking, 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 and, you know, and just gathering crowd, yeah. and your relevance and significance is determined by how many crowd you are able to gather. <laughs> it's like a stadium, you know, even though I'm a mega church pastor myself, but no, you have to downplay that. The whole idea of a church is to equip believers so that they will be like Christ and will be able to manifest Christ everywhere, especially in their spheres of life. Mm -hmm. And so that's what you've started to do. And so you are in the minority right now, not just in Australia, but all over the world. People who preach the message of the God's kingdom, they are very few right now. Not too many people understand the message of the kingdom. But really, God didn't tell us, go preach the message. He said, you know, uh, he said, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached as a witness in all nations. This gospel of the kingdom is not the gospel of healing. It's just a benefit of the kingdom. It's not the gospel of grace. That is just part of the kingdom. It's not the gospel of prosperity. That's just part of the kingdom. These are segments of the kingdom wow. people are preaching. But the real message, the one message that he asked us to go preach, is the gospel of the kingdom. And most churches still don't understand this. If most Christians don't understand it. They don't know what it is. They use the word kingdom, but they don't really know what it means to preach the gospel of the kingdom. And that is what you are already pioneering. You are pioneering that. And even with the idea of going back to the home churches, that's how it all started in, in, yeah. the, in the New Testament. So we are going back to the New Testament, not just in the form or in the format, but also in the, in the content, which is in the message, which is the message of the kingdom. That is the number one thing that must change. The next thing that must change is that uh, we thank God for America, and America has really been a blessing to the world, but 
there is this movement that has re that has really becoming prevalent in uh, charismatic churches and you know new churches is word faith doctrine, word faith theology. When everything is about you know blessing, prosperity, money, things like that. That the emphasis of the church will have to move from that to the, what the heart of God is all about. The heart of God is about, he says, let thy kingdom come to the earth as it is in heaven. So if I understand that well, it means that if there is, if there is, uh, the Bible says, okay, what is in heaven? The Bible describes to us heaven as a city, beautiful, with streets made of gold. So it means that we have to, if the, kingdom of God should come to the earth as it is in heaven, it means we have to train our believers, our members, to explore ways to build cities, to explore ways to build roads that will glitter like gold, to explore, I mean, to teach our people to be able to bring the reality of heaven to the earth. If the Bible says that the heaven, there, is no, there are no tears in heaven, there's no pain, no tears, it means that we have to train our people to, to, to go into research, medical research, to reduce pain, pain, sorrow, everything that is causing tears in people. We've got to reduce it. Why? Because our model, our standard is heaven. And over there in heaven, there is no tears, no, no wow. pain. So anything that will, well, that will help ease the pain of people, that is what our focus should be like. And the Bible says that in heaven, that there will be no, no people of all nations will be gathered. There will be no discrimination. Nobody will say you are this, you are that. So those are the kind of things. So I want to repeat heaven here. Everything you read about heaven, the Bible says that heaven, there is no darkness there, which means that anything that represents darkness, you know, ignorance, anything that represents uh, you no know, torture, oppression, those are the things that we develop ourselves, we develop ourselves mentally, uh, scientifically, technologically, you know, spiritually, to be able to disperse darkness. Anything that is putting people down, we destroy it because those things are not there in heaven. The Bible says that heaven is, 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 is a kingdom of love because God himself is love. So it means that what we teach people to do is about promoting love. Everything that is going to promote love, that's what we are doing. So everything that we know that is in heaven, if anything is in heaven, that is what we are supposed to dedicate ourselves to, 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 to emphasizing and to spreading here on earth. This is how thy kingdom comes in, on, on earth as it is in heaven. The standard is heaven. The standard is as heaven is, we duplicate it here. For example, in heaven, we know that the angels, uh, they, they travel by... Tele teleportation, teleportation. So it means that we should teach our young people to develop technologies of how they will be able to teleport. Something like that will happen. Somebody has to develop it. Everything was impossible until somebody developed uh, uh, light and electricity and uh, plane and uh, you know ocean liner and all these things. So and and these are all things that are already reality in heaven. The Bible says that in heaven, that uh, you know everything is perfect. It means that we do that here too. We move towards perfection in everything we do. The fact that I'm look, you are in Australia and I'm in Europe, and we are talking like this is because of technology. But this is also a reflection of heaven because in heaven there will be no there will be no barrier, there will be no distance. You know, whenever you can bring everything together in a second. So the same thing, this has to be duplicated here on the earth as well. And it's going to happen through technology. So we, it's not just religion. People are looking at Christianity as just a religious practice of just, you know, you know, from people dancing, praise. No, no. It's all about exploring the resources that God has already given to us. Because God says that the earth is, he has, you know, the heavens of the heavens belong to God and he rules over the heavens. But the earth he has given to the sons of men that we will explore the earth. We will rule over the earth. So we are supposed to explore technology. We are supposed to explore science. We are supposed to explore biology. We are supposed to explore uh, the oceans. 
We are supposed to explore the seas. We are supposed to explore the, 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 the forest, the air, the space, the cosmos. We are supposed to explore uh, you know, everything to duplicate heaven for the purpose of duplicating heaven. And that is when you serve God. You don't just serve God when you go to church or you do some religious stuff. No, you serve God when you are bringing the kingdom of God from earth, I mean from heaven to the yeah. earth. When you are duplicating heaven on the earth, that is when you really serve God. That is such a good word. And that's where like in the medieval times when a new territory would be taken and the king would set foot, it would become the king's domain. And, yes. and we're looking at, and what does that look like for every area of society mm. you know, in even in education for children you know we're seeing yeah. it hi, hijacked right now in australia by the leftist agenda and um they want the to reason they're able to do it is because christians didn't go there before them christians were not hijacking it so these secularists did it <laughs> exactly and and that's where it's like you know you can you can remove something but if you don't feel what's been removed it's just going to be filled with something else and i think that's yep. such an Im important message that not only are we uh removing powers principalities pulling them down in the spirit um if there's a void or a vacuum that's created it needs to be filled with something which is the kingdom of god yeah and i love how you're talking about that looks like you know um looking into biology the oceans the air and if we don't do it someone else will um yeah you, you reminded me of ephesians three twenty: whatever we hope dream or imagine he will do infinitely more Yep. And I really feel that, you know, when God gave us our imagination, it was always to be created or to be partnered with our prayer life. And so one thing we've been doing with, with our community is how, how far can you take your imagination when you pray? You know, how mm. far can you take your imagination when you release decrees and, and mm. declarations? And obviously it, we're seeing, hearing some crazy things being released, but we're starting to see the fruit of that as well as people come into agreement and, and partner with that. Um, yep. I'm, I'm looking at the, your book here, uh, Church Shift, and the, the page that you posted on Facebook that you'd highlighted. And number seven on, the, on that page of chapter two, Kingdom Principles, it says here, but I'm using my faith to subdue and change a nation. I love that. It's like, you know, you're saying some people use their faith for a new car. That's like down here. You're like taking your faith, man, for a nation. And, you know, the I, I think it's in Psalms or Proverbs. It says, ask and I'll give you the nations as your inheritance. So yes. there's, there's an inheritance that's waiting to be ac ac accessed. Um, and we do that by faith. And I love yep. it that, you know, you're, you're, you're actually claiming nations. Jesus is the desire of the nations. And if you look at the, the end goal of the kingdom or our role here on the earth, it's not just to see converts, but actually to see whole nations become discipled. Yes. And I believe that's what you've been pursuing for so long. And the fruit of that is, is evident, which is so powerful. Um, I've, you've got here also on, on that book, if the church doesn't start fighting corruption, it will keep flourishing in the country. And this is something that's actually in, in Australia in the news quite often, especially at the moment. Um, we're, we're seeing corruption. and But the church is almost fighting between themselves that one, you know, one campus saying this one campus saying the opposite There's, and it's like, well, what does it look like? Cause I know that you've um, with the orange revolution um, that was, I guess, almost toppling or, or cha changing of government because something had happened in the wrong person or whoever was put, the, the election was rigged. Is that right? Originally? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And then, you know, the orange revolution took place and, I believe you, you brought a shift from the, the outcome was it was a change in government. So what yes. does it what does it look like for the church in this hour? Um, you know, because obviously the, the Bible says we're to honor our leaders and pray for those who um, God has placed over us. So, you know, there's a tension there. We, we, we're called to honor those in government, but whether, you know, so what does it look like to honor and pray for our leaders, but also not, just allow the blanket to be pulled over our eyes and be subdued um, almost ignorantly or, or even, even, even knowingly. Um, what does it look like for the church to stand up in this, in this season or this hour um, against corruption? 
Yes, number one, the first thing we need to do, definitely, the Bible says to honor leaders and to obey leaders. So what we do is that we pray for the, for the leaders and for the government that is on seat, that is in power right now. But while we are doing that, we are also raising up Christians who will be able to do what is right. So we're not just pay, praying and supporting the leaders that are there right now, but we are raising people. We are educating people. We are uh, starting movements. We are starting, you know, uh, we are joining parties. We are bringing values of the kingdom. We are preparing the alternative. We are, you know, raising up people who will do better. Because if we just say we're just going to be happy with the people, things the way things are right now, and then we are not doing something to make things better, things will only get worse, and only the worst people will come to power. That's what we did in Ukraine. It's not just with the Orange Revolution. Even after the Orange Revolution, we were able to start three political parties from our church. And, you know, and uh, one of those political parties won 30%. At one, wow. one time, it won 30% of the votes in our uh, capital city here in Ukraine. Another election that we had, we, it won 34% of the, of, of the votes. And so 34% of the parliament, of the city parliament, was from our church. Another time, if the first time it was 30%, the second time it was 34%. Then the mayor the, was also the member of the church. Why? Because we were busy not just praying and supporting the existing government, but we were busy raising up godly people, godly voices, who will do what is right for the people and for the kingdom of God. And that, so it's all about praying for the government, but also be more dedicated to the truth, the truth of, uh, of the Bible, the truth of the constitution, the truth of, you know, of uh, the law, and exalting the truth or the law above individuals. There is equality before the law. So even the authority, authority that is there, we don't just pray for them because they are above the law. No, if they are doing something that is not in line with the law, they should, they should be subjected to the law. So it is the law that is exalted above everybody else, is exalted above the leaders themselves. So we are dedicated to the truth, and the law is the truth. So the truth is what we are dedicated to. And anybody that's going to pursue the truth are the people that we support and promote. Come on, that's such a great answer. That's awesome. Um, I'm just just written down here. Um, I love that you're, yeah, yeah, you're praying for your leaders, but you're also raising up leaders to take those positions yes. as well. And it's, I'm 40 because years. If you don't train them, you don't just pray and hope that some people will come from nowhere. Angels will not come and take those positions. No, you've got to raise them up. <laughs> you've got to train them. Yeah. Yeah, that's so good. Um, one thing we're witnessing at the moment, I'm 40 years of age. Um, one thing we're witnessing at the moment is almost a resurgence in, in the young adult movement. So uh, the 20, 20 to 30 year olds, um, almost like back in the 60s, there was the, the Jesus people movement. And, you know, people were getting saved all over the place, especially in California. And, but what we're seeing now is almost a resurgence of a Jesus people movement, but not just salvation. We're actually seeing disciples. Um, what, what, what's it like at the moment, I guess, the climate with, with young people in that age demographic, say 18 to 30 years of age? What, what does that look like? In well, what I will say is that it is what the, the problem and the mistake with the Jesus movement is that that movement brought out and brought about uh, a salvation movement, uh, revival, salvation revival. Sure. But the discipleship they did, they had some discipleship, but the discipleship they did was mainly for them to become good Christians who are, who are family, who go to church, who don't use drugs, who don't drink. Those are good enough. But there is another level of discipleship that we're supposed to give to people. Yep. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 1, he said he created man and woman in his own image and commanded them to be fruitful. So what we have to train our young people to learn to be fruitful in industry, to learn to be fruitful in commerce, 
to learn to be fruitful in, in, in processes, to learn to be fruitful in, in products, to learn to be fruitful in finances, to learn to be fruitful in medicine, to love, learn to be fruitful in technology, being fruitful. So, because the Bible says, have dominion over the, the, over the sea, over the waters, over the land, over the things that cripple in the waters, over the animals. Over... So the fruitfulness that God is talking about and the multiplication is about being, having results, having dominion, be yeah. fruitful in, domin in dominating over your sphere of life. Be fruitful in producing fruit in every area of life, in, in exploiting the sea. Be fruitful in exploiting the waters. Be fruitful in exploiting the land and the, and the forest. And be fruitful in technology. Be fruitful in medicine. Be fruitful in, in information technology. Be fruitful in uh, blockchain technology. Be fruitful in, um, you know, in internet technology. Be fruitful and multiply. Then you will have dominion. So discipleship must go beyond just religious jargons and you know, practices. So good. And yeah, and we're called to produce lasting fruit. And yeah. I guess when I, when I read that word lasting fruit, it's, it's fruit that will even um, outlive you into the next generation, yeah. which I mm -hmm. think is really powerful. Man, you, <laughs> I love, I just love the, the plane that you're thinking on. It's, it challenges me. And those, those, and we'll put this up on YouTube and those that are going to watch it, I, I really believe it's going to challenge the way they're thinking because often we're so conditioned to think a certain way, whether through media, through education. I mean, even the church, like you, you mentioned with the Jesus people movement. Um, yeah, it was, it was really the gospel of salvation. The, the kingdom wasn't really understood and they're they getting saved. They're waiting for the second return. Um, but they were yeah, just taught to be good people and go to church on a Sunday. Um, and yeah, but, what we're seeing with our young adults is, is very similar to what you're, what you're speaking now there. And we're seeing a real creative edge with our young adults, um, with the songwriting, with, with film, um, with creating websites that the whole that age of information technology is, is phenomenal. Um, we've been going an hour now, so I don't want to take too much more of your time. It's, I know it's very valuable. You're a, a man in demand. You have a very busy schedule and I'm very honored to have this hour with you. Um, what does it look like? Just to maybe, maybe two more questions and we can finish that up if that's, that's okay. Or you can keep going. It's up to you. I'm, <laughs> it's your choice. Um, what, what does it look like for Sunday at Elijah? What's, what's on his, what's on your horizon? Um, you know, what what pro projects? If, I mean, if they're secret, keep them secret. But if there's, you know, what what is what are you looking to pioneer into in the next season of your life? Number one thing that I plan to do right now, I had a message from God telling me that everything He has taught me here in Europe is just for me to be able to go back to Africa and introduce the gospel of the kingdom. Unfortunately, there has been a lot of the gospel of salvation in Africa, especially in my home country, Nigeria, where I come from. And the message that has been preached there is being diluted with uh, African traditional religion. So what, when you see most Christians and most African churches anywhere, it's mostly a mix up of uh, a, a traditional African religion and Christianity. So people don't really know what Christianity is about, unfortunately. It is syncretism they are practicing. They have a lot of syncretism and a lot of paganism, neo-paganism. So that is a challenge. And I am I'm trying to educate Europeans and help Europe, but my continent has really gone very bad and backward. And people don't even know it. And it's even better when people are communists and socialists because they know they are not Christians. But in the African situation, people think they're Christians because they... They go to churches, they do religious stuff, they read the Bible, they speak religious words, but they don't know that they've not really encountered Christianity. Because if you go to Africa right now, a country could be, could be let's say, 50% Christians, and they're all speaking in tongues and all Christians, but the, con the country looks like hell. The kingdom of God is not being duplicated in the real life, in I mean, the lifestyle and the standard of living of the people is just like horrible. It's worse than in Europe where they don't even go to church anymore because the, the Christian standards have been put into the, uh, into the building block of Europe. But in Africa, 
uh, people are just religious. They're waiting to go to heaven. So because of that, nobody, no, Christians are not building the economy. They are not building the bridges. They are not constructing the roads. They are not building industries. They are not building heaven on earth. They are not creating the kingdom of God on earth. But the instruction of Jesus is let, you know, let thy kingdom come. It's not about us trying to focus on going to heaven anymore. It's about, because we came from heaven, we're going to go, no problem. But while we're here, <laughs> we are here on an assignment to introduce heaven to the earth, to make sure that we, we reveal the kingdom of God to the earth and to make sure that we use the kingdom of God, the reality of the kingdom of God, to subdue the reality of things on earth and to make sure that the will of God that is in heaven and as wonderful as heaven is, is repeated here on the earth. But people are living like, you know, like there is no kingdom of God. They are thinking of going to heaven. But really, you spoke about Nicodemus. We are already in heaven if we are born of spirit and of water. We are already in heaven. We don't need to die to go to heaven. We are no. in heaven now. We are in Christ Jesus. We are no. sitting at the right hand of the Father. Yeah. We are in heaven now. So it's the task of a believer is no more to try to go to heaven anymore once you are a believer, once you are in Christ. It is about bringing that heaven to the earth. But in Africa, Africa is so disadvantaged and Africa is so, so backward because the gospel has not affected the lifestyle of the people. Well, you know, when the early Protestants preached about Christianity, the people like uh, Martin Luther, you know, uh, uh, yeah, you know, all the other people, they, uh, they, they, they were preaching the gospel that worked. And everywhere that Christianity went, uh, they transformed the society. Like Australia, Australia was like a jungle, no man's place. And, but when Christians that came from Europe got to Australia, they were able to transform that jungle, that old place, to become a civilized society. Why was that civilization possible? Because the people they, that brought industrialization to Europe they were, uh, they were duplicating heaven on earth. They were trying to build a fine city like in heaven. They were du duplicating with the principles of heaven, hard work, diligence. They were bringing the kingdom of heaven to come to the reality of in, in Europe. So the people who went to Australia, they had seen how the kingdom of God, how a city is supposed to be, how a nation is supposed to be built. So they took that over there and duplicated it, even without even knowing the concept behind it. But yeah. they duplicated it. So wherever Christians went, Christians went to North America and they duplicated, they brought those same principles with them and they were able to duplicate the principles of the kingdom of God coming to the earth that was already in Europe. They took it to Australia, I mean, to, to North America. So all those countries where those Europeans went to, they are now developed. But the places where there were no Christian concepts, and no concepts of bringing the kingdom to the earth, like in Latin America, Asia, and Africa, because there was no Christian concept there, no Christian philosophy. So they were not bringing the kingdom of God to the earth in those places. They were just trying to survive for today. And when you are living to survive for today, you don't come to civilization because you are not bringing something higher. You are just living for the day. That is still the way the African people are living, even though they are now Christians, but they didn't have the philosophy. No Christian philosophy. And that is what I want to introduce to Africa. Wow. So good. And you, you see that when the Roman Empire was, was taking over the known world, obviously their ideology was wrong. But we've, um, that, that phrase has been coined, all roads lead to Rome. Why? Yeah. Because wherever they went, they colonized um, the place that they had invaded and taken over to look like Rome. And yes. So what if we were to change that from all roads lead to Rome to all roads lead to the kingdom? So beautiful. What, whatever nation you're in, city, suburb, town, because believers know who and whose they are, the kingdom is established. I like what yes. you said. You touched on Ephesians 2.6. We're seated with him in the heavenly realms. We're not seated beside Jesus or below Jesus. We're seated mm -hmm. with him. And when we understand where Jesus is seated, we, we know where we're seated. And we know that Jesus is seated at the right hand, which speaks of all authority. And that, that's where we're seated. So from that place, like you talked about, from that Ephesians 2, 6, seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. We're already in heaven. We're, we have a heavenly perspective. We're looking down into the earth and we're going, okay, this is what needs to happen. This is what we're bringing in. And we're accessing heaven into the earth. It's so powerful. I love it. 
How about we finish on some rapid fire questions? Um, and like just really short answers. We just, I just list a few questions and you go boom, boom, boom. Um, the, first one, the first one is, when are you coming to Australia? <laughs> <laughs> it depends on how much you pray. And I agree if, God, if you convince God <laughs> enough, maybe it will make you come fast enough. All right. Well, I'm going to call a fast. Let's call a fast. On, if you're watching on YouTube, <laughs> three-day fast for Sunnet Elijah to come to Australia. And we'll host him in, at New Nature in Bendigo, a conference on the, establishing the kingdom of, of God into the earth. Yeah. Yes. Do you have a time frame for Nigeria when, when you're looking to head back? No, I don't. I, 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 I'm doing some things. I'm uh, getting the preparation work done. I need uh, the mindset. I need a critical mass on ground before I go there. So what I'm doing right now is like what Americans did with Iraq in the Iraq war. They went with the air, 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 airplanes and air war, war planes and yeah. bomb and just from the sky, <laughs> yeah. you, you know, destabilize the whole place before the grand soldiers went and they just took over the place in a very short time. So that's what I'm kind of doing. I'm using a lot of uh, messages on the, on, uh, online I'm using a lot of internet. I'm trying to prepare the critical mass of people to be on ground so that when I come there, I will not be overwhelmed by the ignorance of the, of that is on ground. That's awesome. If you were to uh, give five keys to, to leaders in the church right now, what would those five keys be? Number one, it's not about religion. And it's not about... That's number one. It's not about religion. Stop looking at Christianity as if it's a religion. It's about duplication of the kingdom of God. Number two, teach people to seek to become like the king. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Seek the king, his character, his values. That's number two. Number, oh, I don't know, maybe number three now. No, the <laughs> next one, yeah. Don't, don't emphasize, don't don't emphasize people being under you. Emphasize empowering people to take over their promised land. Be a pillar, be a, a, a ladder, be a bridge to other people to attain the goals that God created them for. No, ne number four, um, you know, don't, don't, don't tell people that if they have their own vision, then they are bringing the vision to the church. No. You must equip all your members to have a vision for, to expand the kingdom of God. And that is the vision for everybody. And no, no, finally, your goal is not to build a church. Jesus said, I will build my church. Don't wow. worry about it. I will build my church. Come on. All right? And the gates of hell will not overcome it. It's not your problem to build a church. Your problem is to make sure that you train people that Christ is built in them that they become like Christ, that they become God carriers and they become kingdom enforcers, that they will know God, they will become like him and they will be so bold in God to enforce the kingdom of God wherever they go. Wow. Awesome. All right. Two more quick fire questions. Yes. Mentors. Okay. So right now for, for you, who, who are you gleaning from? Um, obviously the, the Holy Spirit is the greatest teacher and he's definitely yes. taught you well. Um, but who are, who are you listening to? Who are you learning from? Who do you recommend? Um, who's, who's a great voice right now in the earth? You know, I used, to have two, I used to have two people that were like brothers, mentors, and friends to me. But all of them went to heaven. One of them is T.L. Osborne. Ah, uh, yes. And another one is Dr. Miles Monroe. Oh, I, I do recall you having a great relationship with... Dr. Miles my, Monroe. Miles yes. Monroe, yeah. yeah. So those are my real good friends. But since they died, my, the last one died maybe six years ago. And since they both went, I'm still looking. I'm looking for the next person to learn from. <laughs> it's very difficult. It's like, well, everybody wants to learn from me now. Rather than, I can't, I can't, it's not easy to find people to learn. Not too many people understand the kingdom, unfortunately. Cool. Awesome. Um, your thoughts on the, the, the glory of God. This is something that is, is starting to, we're starting to hear more in church circles, the glory of God, the glory realm. 
Um, when, when I think it's in Habakkuk, it says that the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. Um, I know that we've had some phenomenal times in the last six months, um, specifically in new nature, when we've gathered where it's been like the glo- literally almost like a cloud of glory has come into uh, our time together and people have just started to repent openly for hours on end. And I just wanted just to know, yeah, hear your thoughts on on the glory of God. What does that look like? What does that mean to you when you hear that phrase, the glory of God? Um, when I hear that phrase, I'm thinking, I'm connecting it with God and the connection that each individual, that is possible for each individual to have with God. The glory of God is talking about the weight of the presence of God. Yes. The weight of his presence. Now, that weight of his presence, we don't need to wait for it. We need to discover it. Come on. We don't need to turn it into a mystery that comes mysteriously, that we don't know when it's coming. What is this? Is it going to come? Is it not going to come? And we just look at it as if something that is sovereignly coming, that, you know, it's something supernatural. No, no, no. It is supernatural, but it is something that you could key into. Everybody could key into it because it is the presence, the weight of the presence and the glory of God. That is the glory of God. They manifest the glory, the weight of his presence coming so heavily, heavily. But well, if God is always there, constantly there, it means that glory is constantly there. So the problem now is how you connect to that glory and release it on the earth. Wow, that's so good. I was thinking about, as you are mentioning that, it's not about waiting for it, but it's about discovering his glory. And yes. when, we, when you even look at some of the songs we, we sing, uh, more of you, Lord, we actually have all of him. It's actually becoming, <laughs> becoming aware of what we've already been given. And I, I think that's really important, you know, like, where two or three are gathered, he's in our midst. It's like we're not asking for him to be there. We're just wanting to be, learn to become aware. And as it says in Hebrews, having your senses trained, you're able to discern, discerning what, he's, right. do, what he's doing that's in our right. midst. Um, that's so powerful. Uh, let's finish up. And I want to honor the time. I don't, I'd love to talk to you all night. I've waited 15 years <laughs> to have this conversation. And you waited long enough. <laughs> yeah, man. And it's, you know, it's, I turned 40 a month ago. So this is just like a late birthday present for me. And, <laughs> oh, very um, good. This wasn't on my radar a week ago. I just, I was in laying in bed and I just felt the Lord just whisper to me, just send Sunday to larger message and see if he'd like to do a, a Facebook wow. live or a zoom. And I thought, well, what have I got to lose? You know, um, I've, I've taken long shots before and a lot of them have paid off. And so <laughs> I just want to honor well, you. You are right in the spirit. You are right in the spirit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I want to honor you and your team. You know, Romans 12, 10 says that we're to outdo one another with honor. And it's such a core value of us here at New Nature that we, we, we actually cultivate um, outdoing one another with honor. So I just want to honor you and your team for taking the time to, even with amongst the, the technical difficulties, um, not being able to Facebook Live how we wanted to. But we'll, we'll load this up onto YouTube. We'll share it around our communities. It's got, I believe it's really going to bless people all over the globe. Um, there's, there's many other things I could ask you. I could ask you questions or not. I'd love to know your thoughts on the, on the fivefold ministry. I know in Australia, growing up, we called every leader a pastor. Um, and it was like most churches were offering, uh, operating on a twofold ministry instead of a fivefold ministry. Mm. Um, I would say in the last five years, we've really seen um, people uh, beginning to be acknowledged in a fivefold uh, capacity, those that are apostles, those that are prophets, um, and not for the for the sake of a title. You know, even Paul writes. He writes, "I Paul, an apostle." His identity was found in his sonship, but he functioned as an apostle. Um, that's one thing we're seeing, I guess, in the church in the nation of Australia, the fivefold ministry coming back to the body to fully equip the saints. If Amen. you could just speak into that for a minute, what what's been your experience? And what does that look like? Um, in at the moment for yourself in regards to like the fivefold ministry in the church? Yes, fivefold ministry is to help, is the leadership of the church. So the, the, the pastor, the teacher, the apostle, the evangelist, the prophet. So these are the main leaders of the church who are supposed to help all the laymen in the church to stop being laymen. They are supposed to be there to challenge all the other people in the pews to discover, it's fivefold ministry are mainly the people who are 
called into the church ministry. Well, apart from them being called to the church ministry, we have 98% of the church itself. What are they called to? They are called into the world. They are called to, 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 oh. to become like Christ so that they will be good enough to be able to carry Christ into the world of engineering, to be able to carry yeah. Christ. So we, the five-fold ministers, should equip them to become five-fold ministers as well, but in the secular world. So good. That is incredibly powerful. And I I love how it says to equip the saints. And a lot of believers don't actually believe they're saints. They still believe they're struggling with their old man. So how do you, how do you, you know, so there's a blockage there. How do you become equipped if you don't actually believe that you're a saint? You need to believe who you know, who you are first, and then you're positioning yourself to be equipped. I mean, your joy in that life is so contagious. That's one thing that really stood out to me 15 years ago, watching those DVDs. Just the joy that you carry, those, those suits that you wear, the colors, I love it. It's <laughs> incredible. <laughs> I'd, I'd love you to finish just praying um, over those that are going to watch this. And just if you have a, uh, one, any last message that you want to release to, to the church, um, yeah, just, just take a few minutes to pray. Um, yes, for people who are going to be watching this, I want to tell them that church is not about entertainment. And church is not about just going to listen to a sermon and go back home. Jason Harrison, look for him on the, on the night. Look for him <laughs> in Australia. If you are from Australia, look for him on the internet. He represents a new generation of Christians that are carrying the gospel of the kingdom of God, which is the only gospel that wow. was given to us by the Lord Jesus Christ. So please... Who up to what God is doing? This is a new thing. This is a new day. This is a new generation. <laughs> people like me, I'm over 50. We are soon going to leave the scene. But people like Jason, they carry the baton. And, you know, you must align yourself with the right people. Amen. Awesome. Well, we're going to wrap it up there. I'll stop the recording in a moment and then we can um, finish up. But You want me to pray as well? Yeah, how about, yeah, just release a, a prayer. And for those watching, I would just say this, just position yourselves to, to receive what's about to be released. We talked about we're coming into a new age and a new season where the internet is going to be um, so powerful for the release of the kingdom and for impartation. God is a God who's outside of time and distance. And even if you're watching this uh, one month from now, there's still, there's still anointing and there's still weight that's going to be released as as you watch this. So receive and position yourself now as, as Dr. Sunday prays for us. So Father, in the name of Jesus, anybody that you make to watch this program is not by accident. You have selected them for something. You have elected them to be privileged enough to contact the grace. So Spirit of God, right now, Overwhelm those people from their head to their toes. Let them be taken over by the workings of your spirit. Let their illumination be open. Let their understanding be open. Let their eyes of the spirit be open. Let them be focused and be connected to the Father like never before. Let the light of God flood their spirit mind and their mind and their soul. Let them begin to walk in the dimension of the spirit. Let the reality of God, the reality of heaven, be so real to them that it will be more real than the physical reality that they live in day to day, day day in, day out. Let them become people who come from above and let them begin to walk in the authority and the power of the one that is in them. And they will begin to act and think like coming from above rather than coming from underneath to the glory of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Awesome. Thank you for your time. I'm going to say goodbye to those watching. We bless you. Amen.